All right, who's ready for the next part of finding out what happens? No, ma'am, you are not gonna be behind me. I'm sitting back. Um, sorry, have to have a talk with lady first. The next part of chapter four, let's find out what happens. Um, we left off with Sir Lancelot and the green knights or the different colored knights all fighting and um, Sir Lancelot winning and, you know, but he didn't want the children to watch. So he, um, so he made them go away and then Catherine decided to put in about tournaments. So Mark was saying, you know, when do you suppose the tournament will be? Not for weeks, maybe by the time here, said Catherine, but for us, a mere wish on the charm. And she merely wished. I can't get used to this being rushed around, complained Martha a second later as she found herself somewhere else for the third time in three minutes. Where are we now and when is it? Camelot, I should think, said Catherine. In tournament time, look. Jane and Mark and Martha looked. Camelot and the field of tournament looked exactly as you all would expect them to look from the description in the boys King Arthur and the wonderful books of Mr. T.H. White. Trumpets were blowing clarion calls and pen pennons fluttered on the blue air and armor flashed in the bright light and gallant knights and trusty squires and faithful pages and ladies and lowly varlets were crowding into the stands in hundreds to watch the chivalrous sport. The four children had front row grandstand seats for Catherine had made that a part of her wish. She had forgotten to say anything in her wish about getting rid of the four horses and at first these made some trouble by wanting to sit in the grandstand too, much to the annoyance of the people sitting behind. But Catherine wished them twice as far as away and they disappeared. At this, the people behind got up and left in a hurry, looking back at the four children and muttering something about witchcraft and sorcery. The children paid small heed. They were too busy looking around them and drinking in the sights. King Arthur sat enthroned on a high platform at one end of the field. The children could see him clearly with his kind, simple, understanding face, like the warm sun come to shine on merry England. Queen Guinevere was seated at his right, and Merlin the magician, thin and wise and gray-bearded, at his left. And now the trumpets blew, trumpets blew an extra long fair, fan fair. Whew. Rewind. And now the trumpets blew an extra long fanfare and the tournament began. Sir Lancelot was among the first to ride out on the field. The children recognized him by his armor. I told you he'd come out all right, said Catherine a bit bitterly. But when Sir Lancelot got going in that tournament, even Catherine had to admire him. He smote down five knights with his first spear and four knights with his second spear and unhorsed three more with his sword until all the people sitting round on the benches began crying out, Oh, Gramercy, what marvelous deeds that knight doth do in that there field. Jane sighed a satisfied sigh. Kind of glorious, isn't it? She murmured. It's the most wonderful age in human history, said Mark solemnly. If only it didn't have to end. Why did it? asked Martha, who hadn't read the king, the boy's King Arthur yet. Partly because some of the other knights got tired of being knocked down all the time and having Lancelot always win, Mark told her. Yes, said Catherine in a rather peculiar voice. It would really be a good deed in a way if somebody knocked him down for a change, wouldn't it? Mark gave her a sharp look, but just then Sir Lancelot started knocking down more knights and he had to watch the field. When he looked again, Catherine wasn't there. Mark nudged Jane hard as a horrible thought came into his mind. Jane turned and saw the empty spot where Catherine had been, and Mark could tell that she was having the same thought too. Just then, there was an interruption in the tournament. A strange knight rode out on the field of combat and straight up to King Arthur's platform. I crave your majesty's permission to challenge Sir Lancelot to con single combat, cried the strange knight in a voice loud enough for the children to hear clearly from where they sat. The hearts of Jane and Mark sank. Even Martha now guessed the horrid truth. How dare she, she whispered. I don't know, said Mark. She's been getting too full of herself ever since we started this wish. Wait till I get her home, said Jane grimly. How call they you, st 
strange sir, King Arthur was saying meanwhile, and whence do you hail? They call me Sir Calf, said the strange knight, and I hail from Toledo, Ohio. I know not this Toledo, said King Arthur, but fight if you will, let the combat begin. The trumpet sounded another clarion call. The strange knight faced Sir Lancelot, and there began the strangest combat, it is safe to say, ever witnessed by the knights of the round or any other table. The intrepid Catherine thought herself very clever at this moment. She had wished she were wearing two suits of armor and riding two horses, and she had wished she were two and a half times as tall and strong as Sir Lancelot, and she had wished that she would defeat him twice. And immediately... Here she was wearing one suit of armor and riding one horse, and she was on she was one and a quarter times as tall and strong, and she couldn't wait to defeat him once. But in her cleverness, she had forgotten one thing. She had forgotten to wish that she knew the rules of jousting. And here she was facing the greatest knight in the world, and she didn't know how to act to start. She knew she'd win in the end because she'd wished it that way, but what was she to do in the beginning and middle? Before she could work out another wish to take care of this, Sir Lancelot rode at her, struck her with his lance, and knocked her back onto her horse's tail. Then he rode at her from the opposite direction and knocked her forward onto her horse's neck. The crowd roared with laughter. The feelings of Jane, Mark, and Martha may, may well be imagined. As for the feelings of Catherine, they knew no bounds. She still held the magic charm clutched in one hot hand, and she wasn't bothering about correct arithmetic now. I wish I could fight ten times as well as you, you bully! Yeah! were the words that the valiant Sir Calf spoke upon the field. It was a cry of pure temper. And immediately, she could fight five times as well as Sir Lancelot, and everyone knows how good he was. What followed would have to be seen to be believed. Catherine came down like several wolves on the fold. She seemed to spring from all sides at once. Her sword flashed like a living thunderbolt. Her lance whipped about he, he, now here, now there, like a snake gone mad. Zounds, cried the people, and lackaday, and whirra, whirra. Jane, Mark, and Martha watched with clasped hands. If Sir Lancelot had not been the greatest knight in the world, he would never have lived to tell the tale. Even as it was, the end was swift. In something less than a trice, he was unseated from his horse, fell to the ground with a crash, and did not rise again. Catherine galloped round and round the field, bowing graciously to the applause of the crowd. But she knew, soon noticed that the crowd wasn't applauding very loudly, and it was only the traitorous kings, the traitorous knights, like Sir Mordred and Sir Agravaine, the ones who were jealous of Lancelot, who were applauding at all. The rest of the crowd was strangely silent. For Lancelot, the flower of knighthood, the darling of the people's hearts, the greatest champion of the round table, had been defeated. Queen Guinevere looked furious. King Arthur looked sad. The attendant knights, except for the traitorous ones, looked absolutely wretched. Merlin looked as if he didn't believe it. Jane and Mark and Martha looked as though they believed it, but didn't want to. And it was then that the full knowledge of what she had done swept over Catherine. She had succeeded and she had failed. She, a mere girl, had defeated the greatest knight in history. But she had pretended to herself that she was doing it for a good deed. And really it had been just because she was annoyed with Lancelot for not appreciating her help enough back in Morgan Le Fay's castle. Her cheeks flamed and she felt miserable. It was hot inside her helmet suddenly and she dragged it off. Then she remembered too late that she'd forgotten something else when she made her wish. She had wished to be in armor and to be on horseback and to be tall and strong and to win, but she had forgotten to say anything about not being Catherine any longer. Now as the helmet came away, her long brown hair streamed down onto her shoulders and her nine-year-old little girl face blinked at the astonished crowd. Those sitting nearest the ringside saw. Sir Mordred tittered. Sir Agravaine sneered. The mean knights who were jealous of Sir Lancelot began to laugh, and mingled with the laughter were the cruel words, Beaten by a girl! Some horrid little urchins took up the cry and made a rude song of it. 
Lancelot to churl, beaten by a girl. Sir Lancelot came to and sat up. He heard the laughter and he heard the song. He looked at Catherine. Catherine looked away, but not before he had recognized her. He got to his feet. There was silence all around the field. Even the mean knight stopped laughing. Sir Lancelot came over to Catherine. Why have you done this to me? He said. I didn't mean to, said Catherine. She began to cry. With flushed cheeks, but with head held high, Sir Lancelot strode to King Arthur's platform and knelt in the dust before it. In a low voice, he asked leave to go on a far quest, a year's journey away at least, that he might hide his shame till by a hundred deeds of valor, he would win back his lost honor and expunge the dread words, beaten by a girl forever. King Arthur did not trust himself to speak. He nodded his consent. Queen Guinevere did not even look at Sir Lancelot as he walked away from the field of tournament. Catherine went on crying. Merlin spoke a word in King Arthur's ear. King Arthur nodded. He rose, offered an arm to Guinevere, and led her from the stand. Merlin spoke another word, this time to the attendant knights. They began clearing the people from the field. Most of the people went quietly, but three children in the front row of the grandstand put up quite a fuss, saying that they had to find their sister, Catherine, who'd done something terrible. But a sister was a sister, and they'd stick up for her anyway. The knights cleared them away with the rest. Presently, after what seemed like at least a year, Catherine found herself alone before Merlin. She was still crying. Merlin looked at her sternly. Fee on your weeping, he said. I wot well that ye be a false enchantress come here in this guise to defeat our champion and to discredit our round table. I'm not. I didn't, said Catherine. Ye be too, said Merlin, and you certainly have. After today, our name is Mud in Camelot. Oh, oh, wept Catherine. Silence, sorceress, said Merlin. He waved his wand at her. At her. I command that you appear before me in your true form. Immediately, Catherine wasn't tall or strong or in armor anymore, but just Catherine. Merlin looked surprised. These fiends begin early, he said. However, doubtless ye be what but the instrument of a greater power. He waved his wand again. I command that your allies, cohorts, aides, accomplices, and companions be brought hither to stand at your side. Jane and Mark and Martha appeared beside Catherine, looking nearly as unhappy and uncomfortable as she. Merlin looked really quite startled. Then he shook his head sadly. So young, he said, and yet so wicked. We're not, Martha ma said Martha, making a rude face. The behavior of the others was more seemly. You see, sir, began Mark. We didn't mean to, began Jane. Let me, said Catherine. I started it, and it's so already time, way past time, so we're going to have to stop there, and we're going to have to find out the rest of the story next time. We've still got a little ways to go, so hang in there. Next week, we'll find out some more of Chapter 4. See you next week.